right, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to start our program here now. So please continue to eat. I know you're still just uh, tucking into your dessert, uh, your lovely dessert and coffee. Uh, so please continue to eat while we start our program here uh, without wasting any time. I'm Keith Richburg, the president of the club. Thank you for uh, coming to this uh, book talk luncheon event. And uh, by the way, make sure you do check out copies of the book, which I think are on sale over here to my right as you're going out. Um, we're coming up very close to the holiday season, and I can't think of a better gift to give than a book. <laughs> so uh, make sure you check it out. And a book signed by the author, who I think is going to stay behind afterwards and make sure that there's some signing going on. Uh, before we begin, I just want to remind everybody, please make sure you turn your phone on to silent if you have a phone, uh, because we don't want any interruptions during the uh, talk here. And also for any upcoming events, uh, if they're not sold out already, uh, make sure you check out our website, fcchk.org. Uh, we do have a new members area on our website. You can see all the great events we have coming up. Um, and I believe if it's working properly, and you tell me if it's not, uh, you can actually book from your mobile phone, you can book from the website, or you can just do the, do the old fashioned thing and just call the office here and book a seat for any of our upcoming events. We've got a lot of stuff coming up, so uh, please do keep an eye on our website or our Twitter feed or our Facebook page or our Instagram or anything else, and uh, you'll know everything that's coming up. Uh, for today, it's going to be very exciting to hear this story of China's Russian princess, the secret wife of Chang Cheng Guo. It was a story that I'd never heard of before, and I spent a lot of time in Taiwan because it wasn't very, really well known. She was somebody who didn't speak very well, very much. Uh, she kept kind of a low profile within Taiwan, uh, but, and it took uh, the intrepid Mark O'Neill to kind of ferret out the story and to bring it to us in a, in a version that we can read in English and in Chinese. So we have both versions here available too, if you want the Chinese version of the book or the English version of the book. I got the English version myself because I want to read it a lot faster. Um, I, I'll, I'll leave the details of it uh, to the author here, but most of you know Mark O'Neill if you spend any time here at the FCC of the main bar. Um, he's a raconteur, a joke teller, someone who's always uh, <laughs> handy with a good quip downstairs. Uh, born in London, I'll skip some of the background, but I'll tell you that he, has, he first came out to Hong Kong in 1978 and has lived in Asia ever since, uh, here in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, in the PRC, and in Japan. He worked for Reuters, he worked for the South China Morning Post and the Far Eastern Economic Review, and he is a machine at turning out books. I think this is about number 12, if I'm not mistaken. And more on the way, I am told. Um, and he, he can't stop. <laughs> so he's a book machine. Uh, and he also uh, reads and writes absolutely beautiful Chinese, which makes us all jealous here. And so uh, without further ado, let's uh, give a warm FCC welcome to Mark O'Neill. And let's hear about the, uh, the Russian princess. <laughs> Inviting me today. Um, whenever we do a book, uh, this is the best venue in Hong Kong to present it. So I've done several of my books here, and they're all memorable. So I thank you again for inviting me. Um, I'd love to explain a little how this book came about. Um, in 1981 to 1983, I had the good fortune to live in, in Taiwan, and Taiwan was still under martial law at that time. And president then was Jiang Jingguo. So as you can imagine, on television, the radio, newspapers, he was everywhere. But we never saw his wife. So I asked my Taiwan friends, does he have a wife? Yes, we think so. We think she's foreign. Really? What do we know about her? Ah, she's a member of the family of Tsar Nicholas, you know, the last Tsar of Russia. Really? Anyway, there were many versions of who she was, but she never appeared in public, she was not on television. Um, so this is when I had the idea to, 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 to do the book. So many years fo followed, and finally I had some, some time available, and I was able to do the book. Okay, one second. Okay, now I put this uh, photograph for you to see first, because it's the most attractive photograph which we bought from the historical presidential archives in Taipei, Guo Shiguan. 
And I, I want to thank them also because I went in to see them and I said, can we have photographs of her? And the staff was extremely helpful and said, well, we have about 3,000, you know. How many do you want? So the ladies put us in front of a computer and we chose the ones we wanted. So I think this one captures better than anything else the essence of this story, because th this is a, it's a love affair between these two people. And um, Fina, the wife, she went through a great deal in life. But her love and her loyalty of her husband never changed, and it continued even, till, even after his death. So this photo was taken in a, in a river near Ekaterinburg in Siberia, which is where the two met. Okay? So she was born in a place called Osha in Belarus, in the eastern side of Belarus. And Osha is on the invasion route between Europe and Russia. So in 1812, do you remember the Napoleonic army invaded Russia? And it went through Orsha. And you remember what happened? They, they, they gave up. They retreated. And they came back through Orsha, and they burnt it down before they returned to France. So then in World War I, when the German army invaded Russia, they also went through Orsha. So she was born in um, 1916. So she was born in, in the most turbulent time. She lost her parents when they were when she was very young. So she and her elder sister decided that it was too unsafe there. So they ran away, and they went to the city of Ekaterinburg, which is in the center of Russia. It's on the border between Europe and Asia. So there was no war there. So she made for herself a new life in Ekaterinburg, and she went to work in a big heavy machinery plant called Uralmash. And that's where she met her husband. So here's a photo of her and her elder sister, Anna. Now, since the parents died, it was Anna who brought her up. So the two of them lived together. Life was extremely difficult. Most products were rationed. Uh, they had no money. So they had to work from a very early age. So that's how she came to be at this heavy machinery plant. So how is it that Zhang Jingguo arrived at the same heavy machinery plant? And his story is even more astonishing. He was born in 1910 in Xiko in Zhejiang, and he was the only natural son of Chiang Kai-shek. So he was educated in Fonghua, in Shanghai, in Beijing. And in 1925, he asked his father if he could go to Sun Yat-sen University in Moscow. Now, this was a new university set up by the Soviet Communist Party to train communists, mainly Chinese communists. But they did accept students from Guomindang also. So initially, his father refused. He didn't want his son to become a communist. And his son was only 15. But later, Chiang Kai-shek changed his mind. So at the age of 15, this very young boy takes a ship from Shanghai to Vladivostok, and then he takes the Trans-Siberian Railway, and he goes to Moscow and studies at Sunatsen University. So of course, uh, at that time, the rule of the Soviet Union was uh, Joseph Stalin, and he was very happy to have the son of Chiang Kai-shek studying in Russia because he could use the sun for his own political motives. Now, the young Zhang Jingguo arrives in Russia and adapts with astonishing success. So he learns Russian very quickly. He uh, learns dancing and drinking very quickly. His wife always outdrank him. But for a Chinese, he excelled in drinking. I mean, he drank more than most Chinese could. He did very well in Sunnitin University. When he graduated, he went to a military academy in Leningrad, which was for officers of the Red Army. And he did a PhD on uh, guerrilla warfare. 
and he could, could have become an officer in the Red Army. But when he graduates from Leningrad, he asks uh, Stalin if he could go back to China, because he's finished his studies there. But Stalin refuses. Now, why does Stalin refuse? Because Stalin has two allies in China. One is the Kuomintang, and one is the Communist Party. And Joseph Stalin is backing both of them. He's not sure who's going to win. He, doesn't sh he wants to use both of them for his own benefit. So he decided it's better to have Jiang Jingguo in Russia as his hostage than to let him go home. So then Jiang Jingguo has all the experiences of communism. So he's sent first to a, a Renmin Gongshe, you know, a rural commune outside of uh, Moscow. Then he's sent to a labor camp very close to the Chinese border in Altai. It's very near Kazakhstan. So he spends about six months there. And in all these places, he excels, even though the conditions are extremely difficult. He works very hard. He w wins the respect of everybody around him. So finally, the, the leader of the labor camp says, OK, we'll send you to Uralmash, this heavy machinery plant in Ekaterinburg, and you can go and work there. So that's how it is. He ends up in the same factory as Faina. So I think you can tell from this map. You see Yekaterinburg in the middle. So that's where they were. And if you see Belarus on the left side, the town of Osha, where she came from, is in eastern Belarus. It's, it's too small to be included on this map. <coughs> so the two people meet in the a heavy machinery plant, and uh, they fall for each other. And she has a lot of suitors. She's very attractive, uh, very vivacious, outgoing. She has a lot of people chasing after her. But Jiang Jingguo is able to defeat the opposition. And remember, the atmosphere in, in the Soviet Union then is very xenophobic, very anti-foreign. And in Ekaterinburg, there's almost no uh, foreigners, very few Asians. So it is really remarkable that he was able to hold down a good job and win the heart of this very popular young lady. Now, does anyone in the room tell me what happened in Ekaterinburg? A very important event happened there a bit earlier. Anybody? Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> this was the city where the communists had uh, uh, seized Tsar Nicholas and his family and had imprisoned them in Yekaterinburg. And the white army, the white Russian army, was closing in on the city. So the communists didn't know what to do, so they, they killed them. And on the site of the killing now is an enormous church. And the family has been... Um, martyred, uh, declared as saints now. So if you ever go to this city, you can visit this enormous church. And that was the place where the communists killed um, the uh, royal family. And after the revolution, the new government turned it into a very important industrial city. So full of machinery plants, engine plants, aircraft plants, very, very, very important. So if you read the book, you, we have some stories about how the romance developed. And they got married in 1935 in March. And in December, the first son, uh, Alan Jiang Xiaowen, was born. And then the next year is 1936. Sorry, this is uh, Jiang Xiaowen. This photo actually is taken in, in China. But I just wanted to show you a photo of the three of them together. But we're still, we're still in Russia at the moment. And this is the year of the Great Terror. So what happens is there is a party meeting. Somebody says Jiang Jingguo is a Japanese spy. Of course he's not a Japanese spy. He has never been to Japan. He doesn't know any Japanese. You know, there are no Japanese in the Yekaterinburg. How could he possibly be a Japanese spy? But that was the atmosphere of the Great Terror. So he's fired from his job. <coughs> 
He has no salary. He just stays at home looking after his, his young son. And he's completely terrified because um, the KGB could arrive at any moment and arrest him, and he would then disappear. And they're relying on the salary of his wife. So I, I, there are a lot of Soviet jokes about all aspects of communism in the Soviet Union. But I just want to tell you one to try to capture the atmosphere of the time. We're in a Soviet uh, labor camp in Siberia, and there are three people who've just arrived. And it's minus 40 degrees, and they're in this hut, and they're absolutely frozen, trembling with cold. And they just want a little warmth. So one asks the other, well, why are you in the camp? And the man says, I opposed Beria. Beria was the head of KGB at the time. So then this man asks this, the third man, why are you in the camp? And he said, I supported Beria. So then the th third man asked the first man, well, how about you? Why are you here? I am Beria. <laughs> So, so this uh, ex explains the atmosphere in, in Soviet Union at that time. So then, it's December 96, we have the Xi'an incident. What was the Xi'an incident? What happened? <laughs> yes. Chiang Kai-shek was kidnapped by Zhang Xueliang. And as soon as Zhang Jingguo heard this news, he writes a letter to Stalin. He says, look, this is your chance to get the Guomindang and the communist army to, to unite and fight against the Japanese. And Stalin's nightmare was that China would have a pro-Japanese government and the Japanese army would invade Siberia. So Jiang Jingwo said, send me back to China, and I will ensure that this union of the communist and the KMT armies occurs, and they will fight against the Japanese, and the Japanese will not attack the Soviet Far East. So Stalin is persuaded. So he agrees for him to go back to China. So Jiang Jingguo is very happy about this news. But how about Fina? Is she happy about this news? I mean, Fina thought she was going to spend her life in, in, in the Soviet Union. She was 100% a Russian lady. She didn't speak Chinese. She had no knowledge about life in China or anything to do with China. So suddenly, she and her husband are going, going to China. So they take the train to Vladivostok, and then they take the boat to Sh Shanghai, and they get off the uh, ship in, in the Bund. And uh, can you imagine the feelings of Fina at this moment? She's, she's nothing to wear. I mean, she's just wearing the very drab clothes of the Russian worker. She, 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 she goes, as the ship goes down, the, Huangpu River, you know, she's just in astonishment to see all these buildings and these skyscrapers. She's never seen anything like this. And of course, she's afraid that in China, she will be dumped. That her father-in-law and her mother-in-law will say, you cannot possibly marry a foreigner. How can the emperor's son have a foreign wife, a Western wife, even, even worse? So she's very afraid that this will happen. So the first meeting she has with uh, Chiang Kai-shek and Song Mei-ling, she's very smart. She brings along Alan, the son. So this was the trump card. When Chiang Kai-shek saw the grandson, his heart melted. So no problem. And Song Mei-ling also liked her. So Song Mei-ling gave us some new outfits and also gave her money, but secretly, because Zhang Jingguo was a very thrifty person. He didn't like to spend money. So 
when Song Meiling gave money to Fainai, he had to do it without Chiang Kai-shek knowing. Now, this is a very wonderful photograph. So what happens to Jiang Jingguo when he arrives in China? His father is very suspicious. Is he now communist? Is he a member of the Soviet Communist Party? I don't trust him. So he has to spend nine months of, of, of study. He must learn again the Chinese characters, and he must write an account of his life in the Soviet Union. But he cannot write it in Chinese. He's forgotten most of the characters, so he writes it in Russian. And a translator makes it into Chinese and then sends it to his father. So this was one of the resources for my book. I mean, you can buy this, this book. He describes the life in Russia. Now, of course, I don't think he tells you the whole truth. He just tells you what father wants to hear. But the main thing is to prove he's not a communist party member. So the, the book is mainly his daily life, uh, the things he did, the people he saw, and so forth. So this photo here is taken in Xikou. This is the native place of Jiang Jingguo. And this is the birth mother of Jiang Jingguo, Wang, no, Mao, Mao, da, 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 da. Uh, Mao Fumei, Mao Fumei. Now, of course, Jiang, Jiang Kai-shek is not married to her anymore, but she lives in the <coughs> ancestral village. And here's Fina, and here's Alan, the, the firstborn. So, Jiang Jingguo is busily learning Chinese characters, writing his autobiography, and Fina is busily learning how to be a, a Chinese wife. Now, we are very lucky today we have uh, Jiang Sumei with us, and she learned Chinese from her mother-in-law. So she has quite a strong Ningbo accent. And uh, I think Ningbo accent is quite hard to understand. Yeah? Anyway. So Fina is a very uh, enterprising lady. So she rides horses. She goes swimming in the local rivers. And of course, for all the villagers in this place, it's unbelievable. I mean, they've never seen a foreign woman before. And even less have they seen one riding a horse, and even less have they seen one going swimming. And she continues to do this even when she's pregnant with the second, the second child. So one of the local women says, look, it's very dangerous for you to go swimming. You know, the, the, the next Jiang Jingguo is, is inside. And she says, no, it's the second Faina. A very good answer. So the nine months pass. Jiang Kai-shek is, is convinced his son is not a communist. And so he allows him to start his official work. So this, this is the, uh, the, the, the in-laws. <coughs> so as you know, Japan has now occupied a lot of North central and eastern China. But they haven't occupied the town of Gannan in southern Jiangxi. It's a very poor, remote area. And it's of no economic importance. So the Japanese didn't want to occupy it. So Jiang Jingguo becomes the commissioner for this area. So it's about 2 million people. And this is a very happy time for Faina in her life, because um, she accompanies her husband everywhere. She, she meets a lot of local people. She has to raise money for the war effort. Uh, whenever there are guests at home, she will entertain them. And everyone, of course, wants to ask about life in the Soviet Union and their love affair and life in the factory. And she greatly enjoys this life that she has there. And she'll never have such a life again. It's only because it's a small, remote place. It's not important in the Chinese system. But her husband needed her to help him at this moment. And in the summer of 1944, the Japanese army launches the Sangguang campaign. It's the last great campaign of the Imperial Japanese army in China. And they overrun this town. So um, Zhang Jiguo and his wife and children, they have to escape. And they go to live in, in, in Chongqing, which is the national capital. Now, anybody tell me who this lady is? 
I'm sure our Taiwan friends will, will know. No. She's called Zhang Ya Rou. She was the secretary of Jiang Jingguo, and she becomes his mistress. So she has two twin sons, born in 1942. And so he's got two sons by Faina, and now he's got, sorry, not, not two, two children by Faina, and now he's got two sons by this lady. <coughs> But in November 1942, she dies suddenly in a hospital. So most people believe she was assassinated, but there's a lot of controversy over who killed her. Was it uh, the Guomindang secret police? Was it the local secret police? Was it uh, someone on the staff of Jiang Jingguo to get her out of the way? Anyway, she dies in November 1942, and it's a very tragic thing for her sons and also for Jiang Jingguo. <clears throat> but the two sons later go to Taiwan, and both have very successful careers. One of them becomes the foreign minister of the government. He's the secretary general of the Kuomintang. And I wish he'd given me an interview for this book, but. Uh, <clears throat> he declined because he said, your book is about, it's not about my mother. It's about, <laughs> it's about his official wife. So uh, Jiang Jingguo is very guilty about these two sons. So whilst they go to Taiwan and he, he, he looks after them, he does not allow any contact between them and him. Everything has to be done through a third party. So. It's an attempt to, I think, to, to hide it from his wife and express his remorse, I think. So where are we now? Hmm? Which city are we in now? Japanese air raids? We're in Chongqing. The Japanese Air Force did mass bombings of civilian areas in Chongqing, and absolutely horrific. And in Chongqing, they built miles and miles of underground tunnels. And this is one of them. And of course, the Germans then did the same thing in, 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 in Britain. And then the Americans and the British did the same thing in Germany and continental Europe. <coughs> so what's this? Yes, so this is the s surrender of the Japanese at the end of the war. So end of war with Japan. But of course, for China, it's not the end of the war, because now the civil war begins. So this is a very difficult period for Faina. She doesn't live anymore in Chongqing or Nanjing, which is the new capital. Her husband puts her in Hangzhou, which is a very nice place to live. So she lives there with the children and the staff. And her husband stays in Nanjing, which is the capital. And her son become, uh, her husband becomes more and more involved with, with the civil war and advising his father. And uh, his whereabouts is a military secret. So it's very hard for her to find out where he is or to contact him. It's extremely uh, traumatic period for her. The, the final place they live is in, is in Shanghai. And I'm sure you know the story. In 1948, Shanghai had this very high inflation, and the Kuomintang introduced a new currency, and uh, the reform failed. And Jiang Jingwo was in charge of this reform, and he failed. So um, that was a great disaster for the Kuomintang. So in April 49, he decides it's too dangerous for his family to stay in, in the mainland, so they take a plane similar to this one, and Faina and the children and the, the maid, they fly to Taiwan, but Jiang Jingguo stays in the mainland. So they're separated for eight months, and as you know, Jiang, Jiang Kai-shek refused to leave. He could have left any time you know, in 1949, but he insisted on staying. So finally, he's in Chengdu in December, 
you know, the, the, the PLA have captured all the areas around it. This is the final hideout for him. So it's uh, 16th of December. He gets on a plane with Zhang Jingguo, and they have this masterly pilot who definitely saved the life of these two men. Because the pilot has to fly from Chengdu, which, as you know, is the southwest of China, uh, to Taiwan. And he's flying through areas which are PLA controlled. So he can't have any radio contact or, or, or any communication with the land. Uh, it's extremely difficult to navigate. But he's a master pilot. So anyway, he gets through and lands in, in, in Taiwan. So from this period, the family life becomes much better. They have a nice house near Zhongshan Beilu in the center of uh, Taipei. And they have a, a good uh, family life. Uh, they can go out to restaurants. They can go to the movies. So uh, this picture captures well the, the family atmosphere. So there we are. There's uh, wife and husband. Eldest son, Alan, then the, the girl, she's the second one, and then two more sons. Okay. So they both of them like um, hill walking. So there they are hill walking around uh, Taipei. And here's a very good photograph of him with his brother, Jiang Weiguo. Now, Jiang Weiguo was not the natural son of Chiang Kai-shek. He was the son of a Chinese uh, Ken Chi journalist and a Japanese lady. And he asked Zhang, Zhang Kai-shek to adopt him, so he did. And Zhang, Zhang Wei-guo has a most amazing history, too. He was sent by his father to a military academy in Munich. He graduated from there. He joins the Wehrmacht. He's put in charge of a panzer unit. He leads the panzer unit into Czechoslovakia. He then takes his panzer unit to the border with Poland. And he's waiting for the order to invade Poland. And then his father decides very wisely to, to, to he should come back to, to China instead. So in Taipei, there is a German club. And where, when I lived there, there was a Swiss German student on the same floor with me. And he used to go to this German club. And he told me that after only two beers, Zhang, Zhang Wei Guo would give you the full Nazi Step. He would march across the, the floor, the dance floor, in the club, just as the, the Nazi Wehrmacht did. And this was, this was great amusement for everyone in, in, in the room. So, yes, so the 50s was, was a, a good period for Feiner. So family life was quite normal. And there were a small number of white Russians living in Taipei. So they set up a, a club in uh, Wu Changjie, and it became the Russian cafe. And Fina and her husband used to go there. And they drank a lot, and they sang a lot, and they danced on the table. And um, it was the only time, really, when she could forget where she was and go back to what life had been before. And uh, as I mentioned, Zhang Jingguo could drink heavily, but he couldn't outdrink his wife. And she also smoked a lot. But of course, smoking is not a very laudable thing. So she used to hide the cigarettes in the house. But her sons were too smart. And they always found the hiding places and took the cigarettes and smoked them outside. And in this period, the two of them study a lot of English. Because of course, the US is the big ally of Taiwan at this time. So they, they have to meet a lot of American officials and military officers. And so they study a lot of English. So she was a very joyful lady. She liked partying and telling jokes and dancing. And this photo captures that. Now this is the eldest son called Alan. Now this is a wonderful quote from from Zhang Qingguo. Zhi guo yi, shi jia nan. He made a great success in, <laughs> in running Taiwan as a country. You know, he, he created the economic miracle of Taiwan. It's an extraordinary story. But he could not control his children, especially the two elder sons. So that Alan was the elder one, 
and then Alex was the second one. But Alan was the worst. So Alan didn't like to study, uh, didn't like sports. He was a very bad student. He liked drinking, partying, gambling, guns. He very much liked guns. And because of his position in the Taiwan society, nobody could do anything. I mean, if the police caught him drunk or beating up somebody on the street, once they found out who he was, of course, they couldn't. They couldn't take any action against him. So he very much abused this uh, uh, power. And he and his father had major rows. His father beat him. And Fina had to watch these beatings. And she tried to stop them. And she was completely trapped in the middle. And he suffered from diabetes. So one evening, he, had, uh, he went to a banquet. He drank a great deal. And he forgot to take his pills. You know, if you're diabetes, diabetic, you have to take pills regularly. Anyway, he forgot. So the next morning, he had brain damage. So his life was really ruined by this event. So he remained living for a few more years, but he was not able to, to, to do anything. A nice, uh, happy picture. Uh, this is an official picture. You can see the four children and, and then some of the grandchildren. It's a nice, uh, happy picture. Now, this is the Taiwan representative office in Tokyo. And I'm putting this in because this was the only time I met a member of the Jiang family. This is son number two. So let me tell you about this building. It's very interesting. Uh, one of the Taiwan diplomats told me that before Japan recognized the PRC, uh, the Taiwan diplomats in, in Tokyo knew all about it. So they went to Chiang Kai-shek and they said, this is about to happen. And if it happens, we will lose our embassy in Tokyo and it will be given to the PRC. So we suggest that you sell the embassy to a private citizen, evidently a pro-Taiwan citizen, probably a pro-Taiwan Japanese citizen. And in that case, if Japan recognized the PRC, they will not be able to give the building to the PRC because it doesn't belong to the Taiwan government anymore. But the diplomat told me Chiang Kai-shek was very stubborn. He said, it will never happen. Japan cannot possibly recognize the PRC after all we've done with them. This won't happen. So a few weeks later, it, do it does happen. So the PRC take over the embassy there. So they have to build this new one as their representative office. So I went there to see. This is the second son of Zhang Jingguo. Now, the reason he was there is that um, the, the president of Taiwan, Li Denghui, wanted, wanted to get rid of him. He wanted him out of the island, so he sent him there. But he was not a diplomat. He was not qualified. He didn't know the dossiers at all. He didn't speak Japanese. Many, many Taiwan, Taiwan people speak Japanese very well. And there were many excellent people they could have sent. But instead, he sent this guy. So as an interview, it was rather wasted, because he didn't have any strong opinions or knowledge about the things we were discussing. But the photographs were excellent, because the whole room was full of photographs of his father and his grandfather. So our photographer for this interview had, had, a, had a ball, because he, he took many, many shots of Alex with different angles. But in all the photographs, in all the shots, there were photographs of, of father and grandfather. So this photo was taken when uh, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, Chiang Jingguo, passed away. This was January the 13th, 1988. And in his final years, Chiang Jingguo was very, in very poor health. So he, he very rarely went to the office. His home became his office. You know, the cabinet meetings were, 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 were held there. Foreign visitors would go there. And his wife, Fina, she lived you know, at home. So she lived on the other side of the corridor to his, his bedroom. And there are many very poignant accounts of 
the moments after he passed away. And most of the cabinet members were there. His personal doctors were there. And Fina was in the room on the other side of the corridor, and the door was shut. So after he passed away, the chief doctor says, well, who is going to go and tell Fina in the, in the adjacent room? And of course, nobody, nobody wanted to go. So after he dies, Faina continues to live in, in the same house. And every day she spends time, often several hours, just sitting in the room of her husband. And nothing is moved, nothing is changed. It's as if he's still there in the room. And it's as if she's talking to him and regarding the items in the room. So her daughter, who is living in San Francisco, decides that this is not good. And perhaps she should move to San Francisco. So with great difficulty, she persuades her mother to take a trip. So she comes to San Francisco, and she stays with her daughter. And at that time, one of the other sons is also living there. So she's got two of her four children with her. So she stays uh, for a month in San Francisco. She has a very good time. The weather is very good for her asthma. And the daughter says, well, why not move here permanently? And Fina says, no, I can't do that. I have to go back. My home is uh, in Taipei in, in this house, especially this room where my husband died. So they failed to persuade her to, to go back. So over a 10-year period, the eldest son is the first. He dies. And then the other two sons die. They all die of cancer. And uh, this is a tragedy we cannot imagine for a mother to lose three, all three of her sons while she's still alive. And um, this is a quote from her daughter-in-law. So this is the wife of the third son. I asked her how, how could Fina deal with this grief? And this was her answer. She was a very devout uh, Christian. And that is what enabled her to, to deal with it. Now, when I ask ordinary Taiwan people about the deaths of these three sons, uh, there are different answers. Now, I'm sure you know, in Taiwan, there is two opinions about Chiang Kai-shek. One is very favorable, and one is very hostile. So among the hostile ones, people said, this is Chiang Kai-shek killed so many Taiwanese people. This is a kind of revenge against what he did. I asked my Taiwan friends, is it appropriate to use this term in the book? Because it's very disrespectful to a mother. And my Taiwan friends said, oh, don't worry. You know, it's, it, many people say this. You know, it's, 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 it's not offensive. It's OK, you put it in. But of course, Fina herself, she committed no crime. She did nothing to deserve this. But that is how it was. So she was left with only one child. This is the daughter living in San Francisco. So she is quite lonely for her in, in, the, in the late years. And in the port of Jilong, there is a statue of Zhang Jingguo. So she used to get her driver to, to take us to Jilong, and she, she would sit on a bench next to the statue and sit there for two to three hours. And the driver would just wait in the car, and she would, as it were, com how do I say, commune, speak to the statue, and then would go back to Taipei. So finally, she passes away. This is uh, 2009. So this is the, the photograph uh, taken at the funeral. Uh, excuse me, 204. And the funeral is attended by the president, uh, Chen Shui-bian, and also Ma Ying-jeou, Ying who is the head of the KMT at that time and later becomes the, the president. So this was quite an extraordinary thing, too, that the two most important political leaders of the time 
attended her funeral, which shows the respect in which she was held by everyone in Taiwan. And her daughter-in-law told me that the question of where her remains should go was extremely difficult. She wanted to be buried next to her husband, but in his tomb, in Taoliu, there was no space. As you may know, I don't know what the correct term is, but is it not a temporary tomb? For Chiang Kai-shek and Jiang Qingguo, it's perhaps not their final tomb. So anyway, it's not as large as you'd expect. So anyway, the daughter-in-law told me she persuaded Faina to agree for a cremation, and then her ashes were placed next to her husband. So she could be near to him as close as possible. So she agreed to that. So if you visit the tomb of Zhang Jingguo, you can see the burial, the, 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 the urn of the ashes of uh, Faina. Okay, anyway. Welcome your questions, comments, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, really interesting, riveting presentation. Uh, let's see if we have, we'll go straight to the questions. We just have a couple of minutes. I'm sure the history department here might have a few. <laughs> uh, any, do I see any hands up for questions? And if not, I'm gonna ask one. <laughs> but perhaps I'll just go ahead first, which is, uh, I'm kind of curious, first of all, did Faina lose all contact with Russia? And she had a sister there. Do we have any idea? Yeah, no, this is a very excellent question. <laughs> now, of course, it's the Cold War, right? Mm -hmm. Taiwan belongs to the US camp. The Soviet Union belongs to the, the Soviet camp. So there is no direct mail. There's no telephone links. It's, it's impossible to send anything. So this makes it very difficult for to keep the contact. But one day, a letter from Anna arrives in the office of Jiang Jingguo, a letter to, to her sister. Now, Keith, what does he do with it? Ooh, reads it. He reads it, <laughs> and, and, what, and what does he do then? Fireplace? Or? Well, a shredder, actually. <laughs> yeah, he gives it to his secretary, and he shreds it. And why does he do that? Oh, good question, which you'll answer. <laughs> because he, he didn't want his wife to have any nostalgia or memory or to think about it. He wanted to, to, to wipe it out completely from her, her past. So actually, it was a very inhumane thing to do. And so she had no contact with him at all until after the end of the Cold War, or the Berlin Wall came down. The, the, the country of Belarus was set up. Mm -hmm. And the city of Minsk decided they wanted to have sister relations with Taipei. Mm -hmm. So one day, the mayor of Minsk and other dignitaries came to Taipei, and they asked if they could visit uh, Faina, and she agreed. So they have this meeting, and she very rarely speaks Russian anymore. I mean, she speak Russian to her husband and to her daughter, but not, not to anybody else. So she, at last, she can speak in Russian with this group, and it's a very pleasant meeting. She asked them all about Belarus and what's happened since independence. Um, and her children say, we'll take you on a tour. Because it was, it was now possible for Taiwan people to go to, to Russia and Belarus. But she, 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 she didn't agree. So no, she lost her past completely. Interesting. Yeah. And that was going to lead to my second question, which did she teach the children Russian? Did she teach them anything about the Russian half of their heritage? Um, the, the daughter was the only one who could speak Russian. So she didn't speak Russian to the, the, any of the sons. So what I imagine was this again was decision of, of Zhang Jingguo. Mm -hmm. You know, he, 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 when they came back to China, mm -hmm. he wanted his children to be uh, Chinese children. And of course, Russia means communist Soviet Union. So mm -hmm. if you are in the street speaking Russian, right. at that time in Taipei, someone will, will report you. Yeah. You see, so perhaps it was better to, or no, worse, Zhang Jingguo's enemies in the Kuomintang would say, ah, <laughs> Why is it his children speak Russian? Are they, are they agents mm -hmm. for the Soviet Union? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Ken Meng here. Thank you. Uh, may I ask one quick question? What was her relationship with her very well-known mother-in-law, if any? Thank you. 
uh, Sung Mei Ling. Yes. Yeah, I, I think the. I think the relationship was very good. I mean, when she arrived in China, she was very nervous because can you imagine the first meeting? Sun Mei Ling is the most sophisticated Chinese woman in the world. You know, beautifully dressed, wonderful outfits, makeup, earrings, completely at home with the Chinese elite, with the Western elite. And finally, is a you know, country bumpkin from, from, <laughs> from Russia, you know? So Fina was very nervous, but uh, Su Mei Ling saw that uh, Jiang Yingguo was very fond of her and was a grandson, and so she supported her a lot. So as I say, she gave her a lot of clothes, because she had far too many <laughs> clothes. Not as many as Imelda Marcos, I think, but still far too many. And uh, Jiang Yingguo was very strict on the money. You know, he, he insisted that the, 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 the family had a very tight budget. So Sun Mei Ling found ways to give money to her uh, without Jiang Jingguo knowing. So no, they, they had a good relationship. Yeah. Do we have any? No, the history department has a question. Uh, Hold on for the microphone. Uh, are, there, are there any descendants? And are they influential these days? Yes, there are descendants. And if it were not for COVID, uh, we were going to go to Taiwan and have a big uh, presentation and invite all of them to attend. Um, unfortunately, this, is, this hasn't happened because of COVID. But as I understand, only one is in politics, and the others are, are, are eminent in other fields. And they decided that uh, the dynasty was over, and, and you know, there was no future to be the president as the son of Zhang Jingguo. So they went into business or design, and they're still there, yeah. Any last question? Otherwise, I'll take one. Seeing none, <laughs> mm. I will ask the last. Oh, sorry, there's one here. Um, I was wondering if you uh, interviewed her daughter, because I cannot believe that a woman like that would have no opinion. She must have something to say about the politics of the time, her husband's work, her own sacrifice, leaving her country, her sister. She must have some feelings about them, surely. Well, I did contact, of course, all the members of the family and, and asked them for interviews. And I'm afraid I didn't, I didn't do very well. Um, I think it's because my guanxi is too poor. You know, <laughs> Taiwan is a country of of guanxi. You know? So if you know a good friend of some the person you want to interview, then you can get the interview. But her daughter lives in San Francisco, so I wrote to her daughter. But the daughter doesn't know me, and uh, there was no intermediary. And so the best interview we did was with the daughter-in-law. So this is the the widow of the third son. So yeah, she gave us a very long interview, and she did, did answer these questions to some extent. What she said was, she Fina had no interest in politics. Her husband didn't want her to have any interest in politics, and wanted to keep work and private life completely separated, and she agreed to that. And remember, she was completely an, an outsider. I mean, she had no network of her own in Taiwan. I mean, maybe this is one reason why Song Mei Ling liked her. Because if Jiang Jingwo had married the person you would expect him to marry, which is the daughter of a highly placed Kuomintang officer or government official, then this wife would have had a lot of guanxi and connections and knowledge and, you know. Whereas Fina was outside the system completely. So she was politically powerless. So maybe for Sung Mei Ling, this was an attractive, attractive uh, quality. When, when Zhang Jingbo came home from work, uh, Fina didn't ask him about his work. No. If he wanted to say something, he could say it. But she, she wouldn't say, who did you meet today? And, you know, who did you put in, <laughs> in prison? You know, who did, who did but, you execute today? No, she, <laughs> so that actually, that, actually, that actually feeds into what I was going to ask as the last question. You kind of answered it. Out. You know, uh, Zhang Jingbo has kind of a mixed legacy. On the one hand, there's white terror. On the other hand, the lifting of martial law. And, 
allowing for elections. I'm just the question was simply: Do you have any evidence at all that Fina had any influence on any policies or any positions, or was she completely not involved? You didn't well, ask her, "Hey, should I lift martial law?" Or what do you think? Well, <laughs> Alex, uh, Keith, we have to be very careful. Half the audience are, are ladies, right? Yes. So, is it not the case that any man of importance? It's only a man of importance because of his precisely the, his wife, right. the, the per, precisely the reason for the question. So Jan Yingbo <laughs> said many times that Fina was his best friend, his biggest support, his 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 pillar. And if you look at Jan Yingbo's life, there were so many tragedies, mm -hmm. disasters, failures, plots against him. So who pulled him through all this, you know? So, Keith, of course, I would like to tell you that it was Feiner who <laughs> demanded that he lift <laughs> martial law, but I, I'm afraid I have no evidence for saying that. But, but um, I mean, I think she, she held a very important role in his life, um, uh, you know, as an as a advisor and as a support. And, uh, his life was so difficult, mm -hmm. and the Guomindang has many factions, and they, mm -hmm. you know, fight each other. And you know, to whom whom does he trust? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. well, we've got, I'm sure, plenty more questions, but we really have to get people back to their offices. But I'm sure you're going to stay behind and mm. sign some books, and you can ask uh, you can ask more questions of uh, our our guest Mark up there. But before we let you go, and before they all start buying their Christmas books, uh, <laughs> may we give you the typical FCC gift? And please, okay. uh, as I'm handing this over, give a big round of applause to Marco. Neal. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the books are over there. <laughs> and not only the finer, but other books. So we want to go home with, with nothing to carry, okay? <laughs> Thank you for coming, everybody. Great.